Well, the winter sojourn is over and it's April the 15th. It's time for the sailing season to begin. So I hope this really works out filming from the deck because it's going to be a lot easier for me to film while sailing now from here on out. So I think I'll do a lot more, more of these vids from the deck. So uh, very interesting stuff going on around the world in terms of climate change. Extinction Rebellion has been uh, streaming live from London and Berlin and I've been watching that. I can still get a bit of uh, internet connection um, here even out at sea sailing off the coast of Crete. But I don't want to get involved in, in terms of the, the news events around the world. I'll leave that to other people. I still want to carry on uh, with a retrospective and talking about things like where I left off last time, which was uh, talking about the Aryans and their contribution to where we've got to. Really where we first realized in the West about Aryans. The first awareness we had of the Aryans came about from English colonization of India. So crown administrators, judges uh, serving in India soon after Robert Clive invaded India, I think it was about 1750. Uh, judges in the law courts, in English judges that adjudicated cases in India, <clears throat> continually had these pundits that would, pundits are, by the way, are Indian Hindu lawyers. And they would come up and they would cite all this Vedic precedent in law. There would be like the laws of Manu and all these Hindu scriptures that these Englishmen didn't know anything about. And they didn't really know if these Hindu lawyers were really trolling them because they couldn't speak Sanskrit. And there were volumes and volumes, the huge libraries full of um, all these texts. So, that, you know, they didn't know whether they were being taken for a ride. And so they appointed a particular judge to go and learn Sanskrit so he could do a bit of fact checking. Now, the first, as soon as he started uh, learning Sanskrit, uh, he was absolutely amazed because he suddenly realized that there were far too many words in common with the Romance languages and English to be just a coincidence. So I had a very similar kind of experience um, what, you remember I said I was in that cult and what we used to do is we used to study a bit of Sanskrit and I remember looking up um, one of the things that I promised you to tell you about in meditation and that's asanas so asana means posture and so we went back and you know as a group doing this group study we went back and had a look at the Sanskrit word and followed it the Sanskrit word asana and followed it back all the way to its root, which is a very interesting exercise. And if you follow Asana back, it comes from, uh, the, the root word is to sit, and the Sanskrit root for sitting is asa or as, as if you're American, which caused a lot of hilarity, because <clears throat> it's strange to think that a common or garden English word like us comes from the ancient Sanskrit root to sit. Far from being these exotic people in India <clears throat> that uh, the British thought that they were ruling as, you know, um, very strange alien types indeed, um, were actually probably close cousins. They suddenly realized. And then they suddenly started linguistics and they started to piece together the science of the, the language this lost language of Aryan. So it was certainly dead, but in the study of linguists, in linguistics over about 200 years, they discovered that they could find out a tremendous amount about the Aryans, even though the Aryans were long gone, uh, just from the language. Language is a kind of a, a genome. It has certain rules for how it changes, and it has a certain periodicity for when it changes. So in other words, there's simple rules that were discovered that, for example, that harsh sounds, a K, I think, would be translated over time to be an S, and it would be translated in, in um, 
some chronological time that's fairly consistent. So linguists discovered that they could tell a lot about the Aryans. They found out that they were authoritarians. The society was terribly paternalistic. It was patrilineal, that is that the inheritance is done from father to son. They could see that they were warlike. They had domesticated horses. They had the wheel and the chariot. Now all this they could just tell from the language and going back in the Romance languages, the Germanic languages, um, all these uh, Proto-Indo-European languages and trace them back to reconstruct pretty much what the Aryan's language was even before Sanskrit. Uh, so an, an incredible feat. Then in about a hundred years or more ago, uh, then archaeologists started to catch up. And the archaeological picture started to emerge. And it didn't quite gel with the linguistic picture. Now, archaeologists are not really on speaking terms with linguists. And so they, uh, particularly they're digging up grave sites. <clears throat> now, finally, in the last two decades, uh, we've been able to source the DNA from, from a lot of these, um, these burials. And so, because testing DNA um, is so powerful and you go to the lab and when your results come back, you're not getting a carbon date back like, uh, say, the archaeologists were. You're getting to see inside people's genome. You can read the genome. You can see these population migrations, which are very hard for the archaeologists to see. Linguists could see the, the migrations, but then again, the linguists were left on the outside. Uh, so then... Um, the geneticists now have completely swept the board and whatever they say goes. Archaeologists and prehistorians absolutely hate it because it's democratized the whole story and it's allowed ethno-nationalism to flourish because anybody can get the data sets, anybody, the, the, the genomes are completely uh, open to the public, anybody can get the tools and they can prove any point they want and believe me, it's extremely political who the Aryans were, and in particularly ethno-nationalist stories. So, geneticists are probably given too much credit. Because if you think about it, well, take for example the Romans. If you ask geneticists, to reconstruct the Roman history in England, they would say there is none. Now, historically, we know that, you know, Rome, uh, England was a Roman province for 400 years. If you look at the genetics of England, there's not a trace of Roman occupation during that time. So, yeah, according to geneticists, you can scrub uh, Rome in England. Um, you could scrub World War II. World War II wouldn't exist according to geneticists. Genetics really is something like this. Imagine you come to uh, reconstruct the entire history of America and you only have a very sparse bit of information like the geneticists do. And you only get to dig up one grave and then you have to decide uh, everything you can about the American people, contemporary American people today. Now imagine that the grave that you happened to dig up was, say, Apu from The Simpsons. All right, here's your last question. What was the cause of the Civil War? Actually, there were numerous causes. Aside from the obvious schism between abolitionists and anti-abolitionists, economic factors, both domestic and international, played a significant... Hey, hey. Yeah. Just, just say slavery. Slavery it is, sir. Yes, I am a citizen. Okay, now, the linguists would come in and they'd say... He's definitely an English speaker, and they would give evidence, and they would be right to an extent. And then the archaeologists would say, well, look how he's buried. He's a, he's a Muslim. So, yeah, he obviously comes from the Middle East. And then the geneticists would sweep them all aside and say, no, no, he comes from Pakistan. Um, he's, uh, he's ethnically Indian. 
So therefore, he couldn't have spe be speaking English, and he couldn't have had um, a Muslim burial. Um, he must have just picked that up culturally or something like that. He switched cultures. Yeah, and the archaeologists would have a fit because they'd say, oh, nobody switches cultures. But you, you have in a nutshell in that example why all these people are talking bunk. People are, after all, just people. And this whole impetus on uh, the now the popular genetics that's come about is now it's all about genetic pride. So everybody has now gone to 23andMe and they've all decided that they're proud to have the H1B uh, haplogroup, group and then that means you're Iberian and you can say, oh, I'm a proud Iberian and then you can make all these claims for um, having a right to live in Iberia, be the original inhabitants of Iberia, all this, this kind of bunk. Um, and the same goes for Native Americans and, and no one will admit the obvious that there are a lot of, there's a lot of human migration, nothing's neat, and the whole concept of a nation or an ethnicity is probably bogus. But no one is really keen to listen to that, and everybody wants to prove their point um, <clears throat> in terms of ethno-nationalism. So then Hindu nationalists want to say that, no, the Aryans were homegrown, and as things stand, most of them think, yes, um, the Aryan invasion hypothesis of India was, has been proven genetically to be nonsense. They don't know that in, in the last year or two <clears throat> the, the scholars haven't caught up with the science and the science says yes, uh, the Aryan invasion hypothesis is absolutely proven. The reason why it didn't show up in the genetics before because they were looking at the matrilineal DNA. If you look at the Y chromosome and the patrilineal DNA, you can see that there was an Aryan invasion. It was all males. So it was a hostile militaristic invasion. And then when we back to the Aryans, they were hostile militaristic, genocidal even uh, people. So recently, there's been papers come out to say that the Yan Maya people were genocidal bastards that swept through Europe and they just uh, killed everybody they could, could find. And that's what the genetics shows. Now, the Yan Maya, they are debating are they Aryans? Well, they seem to think the popular notion is that Aryans have the R1A um, haploid uh, genotype. This is the distribution of the R1A haplogroup today. Around here in the middle is where Mount Ararat is, where Noah fetched up. And these are the Caucasus Mountains, where Caucasians are supposed to have come from. So the R1A haplogroup is fondly assumed to be part of the Aryan, and then there seems to be this Aryan diaspora, as you can see the R1A gene spread through throughout Western Europe and stream all the way up uh, to Scotland. Uh, and then there's a lot of debate, is where is the home of the Aryans? Now this is all very important and it was all very political. The alien cortex in a fit of narcissism uh, in the 1920s and 30s, and particularly uh, with the Nazis, <clears throat> they said, well, we are the Aryan super race. Um, and so, just like Zionists, uh, we have the right of return. Uh, Zionists kind of picked up on the Nazi theme and had the right of return to Palestine, also with the same dubious <clears throat> ethno, um, ethno-nationalist arguments. Um, but neocortexes are what they are, and alien cortexes um, do this kind of self-justification. So if you read Mein Kampf, it's all about not <clears throat> we need to kill the Jews. It's about how we, it's a manifesto saying that we have a right to non migrate east uh, and basically claim our Lebensraum back because that's our ethnic her heritage. Um, and so then that's what the Nazis were doing. The atrocities committed in the, in the wake of that ideology uh, really shocked scholars so much that they refused now to really even use the term Aryan. Now, since 1945, you have to call it Proto-Indo-European. So the very word Iran uh, comes from Aryan. But you have to call them uh, Indo-Iranian, 
because that's more politically correct. Even though Darius the Great said that his language was Aryan and he called himself an Aryan. So the Persians are Aryans. That R sound, Armenian, um, the Arman people, um, it really is the signature of the Aryans. It really is some a venerable thing. It's a, it's a, a it's saying of a good family. So it's it's really ethno nationalism. The very word Aryan comes from a kind of ethno pride in ethno nationalism. But anyway, so you're not allowed to call them Aryans, but I'll call them Aryans because uh, Proto Indo European so pie is a bit of a mouthful, and I I just don't like the the political overtones of trying to be politically correct in favor of just being correct. So yeah, I'm not prepared to call Iran, just call Iran Iran and call it Aryan and um, yeah, it's uh, PIE and PI and all this stuff and what are we supposed to call Iran, a pie hole country? Nah, just call it Iran and say that they were Aryans and then they invaded India and they wrote the Vedic uh, scriptures and they introduced meditation in a bastardized form along with a priestly class that was out for money and was out for gain. They were conquerors. They were just like their later Aryan counterparts, the British, that again came back to resubjugate uh, India a second time. So the Indian invasion, uh, the Aryan invasion of India was just like the British invasion and it was from people that were ethnically similar. It was the the second round. And so, yes, Aryanism. So then there became a big fight for who can claim Aryans as their ancestors, with the, who had the most right, and in particular, where did the Aryans come from? Now, if you look today, they particularly come from somewhere around the steppes, the Caucasians. The reason why people like me um, are fair-skinned, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, um, by the way, my, my son has really uh, been pointed out to me many, many times how my son is uh, really the poster child for the Hitler Jürgen. <laughs> so you're hearing all this from the horse's mouth, uh, ethnographically speaking. But in terms of where did the Aryans come from, which is a nationalistic, uh, nationalistically important ethnographic question, and if you look at the maps, I think ethnographers and historians, paleontologists, archaeologists, they're all making the same mistake. They all pin their discoveries on the modern map because they make them on the modern map. They're not thinking back to what's called something which I think was very important in our history. And that's the Black Sea Deluge hypothesis. So I think that what makes sense is this story is the Aryans lived around the Black Sea when it was a freshwater lake fed by rivers by the Danube. Around 7,000 years ago, apparently what has happened is due to sea level rise and climate change, which you may recognize as a theme, the Mediterranean overspilled the Bosphorus and came streaming into the Black Sea. It was probably a catastrophic and instantaneous flood. Now, there's a lot of debate on how quickly this happened and how deep the, the flood was. So the original hypothesis was it was about 100 meters uh, of seawater that flowed into the Black Sea, and it happened catastrophically suddenly. Now, this fits with the mythological record. So you know the myth of Noah and if you look at other Aryan texts, you get the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, so in the Akkadian stories, all over um, the, the folk history says that there was this catastrophic flood, there was this kind of figure who actually um, did survive it, who had foreknowledge of it and survived it, and really populated most of Europe. Now this is not something e easy to d dismiss. If you go back just recently to um, about 5,000 years ago, I think, 
then you'll see that the entire Europe, two-thirds of the European population today, was populated by just three men, three individuals. That's it, two-thirds. So that's a tremendous bottleneck around this time of uh, what seems to be the Black Sea Deluge. This diagram represents the Y-chromosomal tree of European males. The most recent shared ancestor is at the top. Two-thirds of modern European men are found on just three branches called L1, R1A and R1B. These three derive very recently from just three individual male ancestors. Here, here and here. By counting the number of mutations that have accumulated within each branch over the generations, scientists estimate that these three men lived at different times between 3,500 and 7,300 years ago. Their lineages exploded so that now two-thirds of all men in Europe can trace their ancestry to one of these three men. Since there is no similar bottleneck in matrilineal DNA, we have to assume that this is the legacy of an elite conquering Yamnaya army who committed genocide of males across Europe through brutal warfare resulting in the subjugation of women and the remaining population. So I think what was happening is there's the Aryans are these warrior, patriarchal, uh, they breed ho this culture that breeds horses, they have chariots, they invented the wheel, and they're living happily around the Black Sea when the deluge comes in and causes this Aryan diaspora. Some of them go west, eventually getting all the way to Scotland. Some of them go east, they go down all the way uh, to Egypt, they go into India as well. That seems to me what the, the story is, and there is some evidence of this. So Bob Ballard the man who found the Titanic. Uh, he went looking under the Black Sea and did some research and he found settlements. So I think there are amazing discoveries to be had under the Black Sea and I'm surprised there haven't been more oceanographic studies of the sea floor. Um, I guess it's just too expensive for the average archeologist. But I think that if anybody went down there, they would find Aryan settlements and there'd be advanced settlements, and I'd go as far as to say that you'd find that they were geometric. What you're starting to see is the modern alien cortex, um, and you're starting to see its evolution, and it, it spreads as a diaspora from the Black Sea. Now, if you go back to my previous video, the one uh, about Gobekli Tepe, I think episode five, I think what's happening there is you can start to see the religion and you can start to see the split. And you can see that what's happening there is religion starts to form. And what people are doing is they're mimicking meditation using uh, psychoactive drugs. So they're selling stories now of an afterlife. They're no longer suppressing the, the alien cortex. They're not giving you techniques to handle your th um, thanatophobia, your, your fear of death. They're encouraging your fear of death. They're making money out of it. The priesthood is making money out of it. They're teaching that there's an afterlife. They have the keys to the afterlife. And they're teaching formulas to get there. And that's what you can see at Gobekli Tepe. It's almost a theme park of it. You can see there are almost 20 enclosures. It looks like a fairground. You can go to the lion enclosure with all these lion motifs. And they teach you the secrets of that. You, each one of these things is really a pay-as-you-go uh, entrance thing and it looks much like what's preserved today as a fairground. And in this atmosphere they are selling religion, um, they are exploiting people, they're selling these spells as mantras um, and it's going to have consequences of doom. In particular they're selling ways to get pseudo-wisdom. So without doing proper meditation, they sell you drugs to give you uh, all these psychedelic intuitions. But they fake. And in particular, there's one of the drugs the Aryans have, and they wax absolutely lyrical about it, and that's called Soma. Soma is the big drug they're selling. Now, no one really knows what Soma is. It's kind of lost in time what Soma is. 
Nietzsche said that the state is the universal slow suicide called life. What's not often talked about is the fact that a state absolutely needs analgesics just in order to survive. And Soma was the Aryan's analgesic. It gave people a psychedelic trip and allowed them to cope with tyranny. The same way that meditation, all these new analgesics like the opioids, uh, the great psychopathic criminal family, the Sacklers, and the Oxycontin now is the new Soma, and so is your icon, your cell phone, and many other of these things like yoga that they are taught to make the state, civilization, and your tyranny tolerable. I think that was first invented by the Aryans, and they did it with a plant uh, extract that was psychedelic, and it gave them control. It wrested control away from the shamans. The shamans were schizophrenics, and they taught people how to be free. They free their minds from tyranny. So they were a big threat to a tyrant. And how the Aryans dealt with that threat was to substitute what the shamanic religion taught. And they substituted it with a psychedelic drug that they then could compete with the shamanistic rituals uh, using this drug. Now Aldous Huxley absolutely nailed what Soma is and what it's all about in his book, The Brave New World. And in uh, Brave New World, he says that Soma is uh, like Christianity or alcohol, but without the side effects. So he absolutely knew how Soma was used, was absolutely integral to holding a state together so that we can just endure the agony of civilization. What that psychedelic plant was, was so important important to the Aryans that they actually deified it. They got a plant and made it into a god. Now what was that plant? Like all these things it's complicated and there are some substitutes. You will find say they're mushrooms. They are legitimately Amanita muscaria mushrooms, you know magic mushrooms. Yes those are really in some instances Soma. Um, there's bang, bang is the word from Sanskrit. Uh, cannabis. So cannabis has some claims to being the Soma or one of the ingredients in a stew, but they're not the real Soma. The real Soma is a very, very interesting story. One of the reasons I don't believe it's a magic mushroom or the claims that it's cannabis or you keep on seeing these new revelatory um, papers saying, you know, finally the mystery of Soma is solved. Um, but I don't think any of the things that have been claimed to be Soma are credible. One of the reasons is in the Veda it actually says that it has something to do with lotuses and flowering aquatic plants. So that's one of the clues. The other clues because it comes out later. It carries on underground. So the authoritarians have their Soma but shamanism never goes away. It just gets sent underground and it comes up again and again through history. You can see it pop up uh, in the Mithraic cult. In various secret cults and traditions uh, it pops up again. Um, there's the cult of Osiris where clearly it has something to do with Soma and this rejuvenation cult. So there are various clues. One of them is that there are always a couple of snakes involved. There's a staff and a pine cone. If you look at Osiris' staff here, you can see the pine cone at the top and the two cobras wrapped around it. So that's one clue. In some of the Persian reliefs, you can see the tree of life. Uh, so Soma is supposed to be the key to eternity. And here is the tree of life, and here again is another pine cone. So the snakes, the pine cone, uh, C.J. Jung was really fascinated by the Mithraic cults. But you don't see a lot of, uh, or it's unknown exactly what the Mithraic religions were all about, or the Mithraic cults and their rituals. Uh, they're just a few clues from some of the 
the reliefs in the Mithraeums, which are caves underground where they practice these rituals. So C.J. Jung was fascinated by this image, the Deus Leontocephalus, the lion-headed deity. And this has some more clues. Uh, these over here are keys. You can see the snake coil around them here is similar to the staff of Asclepius. And here's the caduceus, the same as Osiris's staff. Uh, it has wings on the top, much like some of the Akkadian reliefs. But Asclepius' staff never has wings on top of it. Um, and there's only one snake instead of two. But there are various clues in this particular image that really fascinated Jung because it was something to do with self-actualization, uh, really immortality. And here you can see the hammer and tongs of uh, Hephaestus down below. And here down in the corner is a pine cone again. And here's our old friend, Asclepius again, with his rooster. Uh, the lion-headed god comes up as very early on the first zoomorphic statue ever created is of this lion-headed god. This is the Lion Man sculpture. It's a prehistoric ivory figurine that was discovered in a German cave in 1939. It's somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000 years old. So the very first statue ever found uh, of a pictorial image is of this lion-headed god. Uh, the first thing to know about it is it's actually a lioness. So it's female. Why the statue is called the Lion Man is because archaeologists piecing it together, pieced together, it seemed to have a penis, but since la later archaeologists have come and corrected the image and said it's almost definitely feline, it's really one of the images associated with Sibylle, so it's her lioness. Uh, so that's the ancient um, Earth Mother Goddess. In the Mithraic cult, it's become this new masculinized god, the Aryan god that has now gone from the Mother Earth. Now this appears as a god in the sky. And what they're selling is the trick. They're selling a license of how to become immortal and really uh, bridge the gap between the mortal human and this immortal masculine god of the sky and the ritual is a ritual to do with soma so these are all clues uh, that give you a hint of what the plant is and i'll leave it till the next episode to do the big reveal of what i think that plant really was